last week's video, I presented the first part of a rather complex layout design in a somewhat difficult space. This week, let's just continue where we left off last time. So now that we have all the major features roughed in, it is time to start filling in details. And I started with the middle deck because that was always gonna be the most critical. I wanted to make sure this would fit satisfactorily and find out if I needed to move benchwork edges or anything like that. So here is the main deck with most of the turnouts connected up properly. There are still some of the major industries that have not yet been filled in. As we can see, the grain elevator and the oil refinery are still just spaces allocated. And I'm really not sure how the cement plant is gonna work. Although it does look like it's gonna be possible to extend tracks between the two disconnected portions of this helix because there will be somewhere in the region of 15 inches of clearance between the two laps at this point. And I broached the idea of extending this track into an industrial branch line with a two track staging yard in the workshop. Now, when I first suggested that, I wasn't sure if he's gonna like it because I don't know what he has built in this area, but he jumped at the idea, said yes, it was a great addition to the plan. This branch line has a lot of extra operational interest just with the two track staging yard at the end of it. And as you can see, I have not yet started filling in the ethanol plant, although I have shown how some tracks might extend through the walls into the utility area, just to give us more capacity. Because this area is going to be somewhat cramped, and he wants to be able to originate grain and ethanol unit trains at this point. Now, another feature that was introduced at this point is the continuous third track all the way from the city area around through both yards, through the ethanol plant, and rejoining the main line just before leaving this level. Basically, that third track forms the switching leads for all the yard areas. Now, it's not ideal because the various yards are fairly close together, but it works a whole lot better with it than it would without it, and providing the various yard operators can coordinate their moves, it should flow fairly easily. But such complications are far better than not having the continuous track through in the first place. And you'll note here that in order to get a big enough yard to justify this crane, we ended up with three through tracks and two stub tracks. I'm suggesting having a road overpass with everything disappearing under it, allowing these stub tracks to look as though they continue, even though they don't. And since it is common practice to double intermodal trains over into multiple tracks, these two stub end tracks can just be used for doubling over westbound trains. Now, although there is space to have another set of crossovers to get from the intermodal yard back onto the main line immediately, we decided to eliminate them and have the intermodal trains continue along the bypass track in front of the ethanol plant rather than going through the commuter station. It means that anyone switching the ethanol plant may have to pause operations while an intermodal train goes through, but it does add some more operational interest. Next, I filled in the lower deck. Now, the client had already asked me to get the CN staging yard twice as big as the CP. So I've got five tracks for the CP and 10 tracks for the CN. Both staging yards also have their own locomotive facilities, although they both had to be on the same side of the main line because there wasn't space behind it. This area in this corner is needed for stand-up access inside this helix. And I mentioned the need to have the two main lines cross over each other between the staging yard and the helix. The double crossover at this point is not it. That is just to allow universal access between both main lines. What I've done here to sort out the left hand versus right hand running is to have the rear track climb up over the top of the front track and become the outer helix instead of the inner one. The front track divides here and the outer track is the return loop, while the other one becomes the inner helix, and the back track crosses over it, becoming the outer helix. So the front track now becomes the inner helix, starting four inches lower and making one additional lap. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we ended up dropping the hidden curves down to a minimum of two foot seven, which is on this inside staging track and the inside lap of this helix. Note how this helix in the utility room, the inside track is the downhill track. The outside one is uphill. The other helix, we did not reduce the radius because it's the inside track that has to be the uphill track. And we didn't want to go above a 2% grade. 
I did pinch an extra inch of elevation at this point by steepening the grade on the downhill made two and a half percent. Although later we undid that idea as I came up with a better way to gain even more height. Now at this stage, the track arrangements in the city area are certainly not finalized. I've got all the main line turnouts working well with the freight loop and the double crossover where the two routes divide. But at the moment, the industrial spurs are basically just placeholders. I just cut a few straight and curved turnouts into this outer track where I thought I might need them. And you may notice that only Canadian Pacific freight trains are able to switch this town. There is no connection from the freight side to the CN main. Partially that was because there wasn't really enough room to get all the point work necessary in this area. And partially it was to add additional interest. If you recall, the client asked for an emphasis on the Canadian National, and we we're assuming that most of the facilities on the middle deck are operated by that company. So to contrast with that, the industries at the small city on the lower deck are going to be switched by the CP. And since the start of the CN staging yard is visible, we've decided that that's going to represent the start of a major yard, while the CP yard for the city will be further away. And at this stage in the design process, we had increased all the track elevations by two inches, starting at 26 instead of 24 something else that we undid eventually. Now, as far as crossing all the openings are concerned, the client mentioned that this floor space was only used twice a year for seasonal storage. So the bottom deck is going to have a lift out section across the entrance of the crawl space and the second and third decks are going to be fixed. In front of the stairs and into the workshop area, the bottom two decks are going to be on a swing gate with the top deck that will normally stay in place as a nod under, we ended up with about 67 inches of clearance under it. Although we decided that it would need to be removable just in case he ever needs to get big stuff in and out of the basement, such as maybe a furnace replacement or something like that. Here is the middle deck with the new elevations. We've also added some more small industries. By eliminating one classification track in the yard, we ended up with space for additional industries along the back wall. We decided that for this to look right as a major terminal, we're going to have some tracks leading off the front edge of the benchwork, implying coach yards and what have you in that location. Normally, this would just be a waste of expensive turnouts, but since these are all going to be standard sizes that the client can be building himself, they are almost free. Certainly, it's not going to be any more expensive in time or materials than any other detail part. At this point, we're also thinking about additional industries along the front edge of the benchwork. The idea being that we add a little operational wrinkle for the yard switcher. He'll have to plan his moves here between the schedules of the through trains. These spurs on this side of the aisle, he can switch from the commuter train access track clear of the main line. Although this one, he'll have to foul the main line while he switches it. So that will need to be very carefully choreographed with the dispatcher. Other than that, all the industries can be switched without fouling the main line. There is one more slight complexity with this yard job, and that is I don't have a short run round track at both ends of the yard, which would be the ideal. So we are thinking that even though only one operator will be assigned to switch the yard, he will have two switches. So at any time he can use whichever switcher he needs to get on the correct end of the cars he needs to spot. Anyway, moving on, now that we've decided that this portion of the layout is going to be fixed, it can reasonably be a little bit wider and we can have another industry at this point. And I've shown how extra tracks can curve away sharply from the main line and disappear through the building, making use of the crawl space for additional capacity. I still haven't filled in the ethanol plant or the cement works because to be perfectly honest, I was struggling in these areas. However, I did come up with a good idea for the sawmill area. So let's move on to that now. Earlier I mentioned gaining more height on the grade out of the canyon area. I came up with the idea of switching this town either in one direction only with a westbound freight or as a local turn from the main yard on the second deck. Meaning the eastbound freights don't have to be able to get back out of this passing track onto the eastbound main. As a result, I can move the crossover back a few feet 
giving us a lot of extra distance to make up the grade. So now, although the grade on this track does not exceed the desired 2%, we've gained an extra inch of height over and above the original plan. Anyway, the sawmill area has a siding clear of the main line, a small three-track yard, and another thoroughfare track giving access to all the spurs. This area will probably be kit bashed from several sawmill kits to make an impressive size structure. There is also a loading facility for bark chips and sawdust. The bark chips will be sold for use in fertilizer or landscaping, and the sawdust will be compressed into wood pellets for home heating. And there is also room to extend some of these spurs through the wall for additional capacity. The Furnace Crete Lumber Co. will operate a couple of rebuilt first generation four axle diesels, and they will be hauling both full-size logs and pulpwood out of the woods. The full-size logs get cut into lumber at this mill, whereas the pulpwood will be switched directly into a mainline local and sold to a paper mill. Now I discovered that there wasn't anywhere near enough length in here to have a decent staging track for the logging trains. So I approached the idea of curving it round in front of the HVAC system, asking him if that would be acceptable, bearing in mind, of course, that it probably has to be easily removable for maintenance. But he wrote back and said that the HVAC was actually suspended from the ceiling with 69 inches of clearance underneath it. So actually that means we can use this entire wall if we want to. Anyway, it was shortly after I completed this that I had an idea as far as the ethanol plant is concerned. Earlier I said that I kept running out of space in this area. Then I had the idea of bumping the backdrop out through the wall between the helix and the tool cabinet. And as soon as I did that, all the problems went away because this is plenty of room now for the shipping area. There are four loading tracks for ethanol, although they're fairly short, together they are long enough to originate a whole unit train. We have the storage area behind it, various other byproduct loading tracks, the main processing center, and of course at the far end, there is the corn delivery with the grinding plant behind it. The client has a whole range of Walther's kits for the ethanol plant. They're all gonna be heavily kit bashed. Not only will we end up with a far more impressive ethanol plant by opening them out as backdrop flats, but it'll take up a lot less space. And you can also have all the interesting sides towards the viewer. And I've kept the arrangement with the corn delivery tracks heading through the receiving building and into the utility room. In the final plan, after I discovered that the HVAC was up towards the ceiling with plenty of clearance underneath it, I extended these tracks all the way to the north wall, figuring that if he wants to, he can stage a whole unit train in each one. There's also some industries appearing in this corner of the room. And we're thinking the operating plan will have all the grain and ethanol in unit trains, whereas the smaller commodities will be switched with a local turn from the classification yard, which will also switch these industries at the same time. And I also filled in the cement plant. I ended up not using the arrangement of having spurs extended through the helix. It just wasn't going to work with having spurs in both directions. Now they all go the same way. But I do have two spurs that are plenty long enough, one for receiving and one for shipping. And I added two more small industries in this location. Now from this point, the upper deck changed quite dramatically. First thing to notice is that there is no longer staging loops over the walkway in the utility room. Instead, what we've done is looped the Canadian Pacific Main Line around the furnace. Note how there is no air duct restricting clearance on this side of it. So we can rise to 74 inches at this point, and then we can gain plenty of elevation to have the sky staging loops as a partial fourth level in the southwest alcove, also giving us another scenic section with another opportunity for some bridges, particularly in this location where there is no third deck below it, allowing for a fairly tall trestle. I also suggested that since this is going to be the highest elevation on level three, this town might be a good candidate for turning into a ski resort with a snow scene. It could be served by his long distance passenger trains, whereas there's going to be no switching at this point because it's already above eye level. Originally, the idea was to have this 
loop around the furnace reappear in the ski scene because accessing it from behind was going to be next to impossible. He didn't like that idea. We're just going to need some removable scenery to access it if necessary. And this loop line allows us to get enough elevation to get to around 82 inches, although we later cut it down a little bit because if you recall, the ceiling is only 90 inches. So we really don't have a lot of headroom over it. But anyway, here is the initial plan for the sky staging yard, level four. The sneak off track for the commuter trains has now become a full fledged subdivision, which we eventually called Northland Sub. So Northland Staging Yard has now become four tracks. We have two shorter tracks in front for commuter trains and two longer tracks behind for freight trains. The short tracks are about seven feet for the commuter trains. We figured we can run six cars. And I think the freight tracks were in the region of 16 feet. Plenty long enough for a worthwhile train. So now let's go to the finished version of this level. Normally I finish multi-deck layouts from the bottom up, but this time I started at the top because I was already working up here. Now because this straight area between the S-bends was pretty much used up with turnouts, the commuter station had to be on the curve in the front corner. I've detailed the industry behind it, showing how it can form the backdrop. It'd be quite a big industry with two tracks. Enough building backs along here to give the impression of a town big enough to be served by a commuter station. The Northland subdivision sneaks off under the scenery. Obviously there'll need to be some removable chunks of scenery, one here in front of the turnouts and a couple more at strategic points wherever the builder decides that he needs them. One of the side advantages with the lake running at this point is an opportunity for a couple more inlets. Remember the customer said he wanted as many bridges as we could reasonably fit in. Now these are going to be very low bridges. The water level will only be a few scale feet below the track because this is above the main yard where we don't want to restrict the viewing distance with deeper than necessary bench work. So I've shown the Walther's 16 inch straight truss here and the longer hump truss on this one. These are the same two bridges that I recently assembled for another client of mine. In the corner we have a rural area with crop farming behind the track, dairy farming in front of it, a spur serving the dairy, needing off stage. The client decided that he wanted to have a couple of reefers drop there. And since there isn't room to run the track all the way into the dairy, there's a gate across it and the operating instructions from the dairy owner are to leave the cars outside the gate and he will switch them himself using a tractor. The other industry in Fredericksburg is Blue Star Ready Mix. And after that, I show a method of hiding where the track has to cut closely around the end of a wall that protrudes into the scene. Just build it up as a high tree-lined ridge with a short tunnel through it. And then visually that wall basically disappears. The other side we have another inlet with another low bridge. Remember that this area is fixed on the upper deck. It doesn't need to be removable so we can have more elaborate scenery. And this is a lift out section. So I've kept it fairly basic just so there aren't a lot of details to damage if anything goes wrong when removing it. The client asked me for a track leading to an Air Force base at this location. Turns out he served in the Air Force during his younger days and he wanted that represented on the model. When I drew this, I wasn't really sure what it should look like, but I've seen some military bases that have a lot of long, narrow buildings. I'm assuming they're barracks with just a few larger structures. So that's how I've laid this out. The client didn't comment one way or the other. So either he felt this was acceptable or he had another idea of how to do it. He also asked for the team track at this point to be switched for an auto rack unloading area. So I've done that. To give us more length in this point, I moved this crossover down a bit and put the switch to the other side of it. The team track was moved to Louisville over the other end of the room. There's another good spot for some more bridges on the short straights at the end. I've drawn the ski resort in. Now, since this is above eye level, we have a row of hotel backs at this point. Only the two end ones need to be modeled in full depth. Now this one has to be tall enough to allow the high level track to pass through the back of it. The ones in the middle can be a little bit lower and then there could be a tall one at the end with a high snow covered ridge visible behind it. 
and then here is level four. I've drawn in the scenery for this. As I mentioned earlier, we eventually dropped it to 81 inches to give nine inches of headroom. And the staging yard basically is on top of the lighting valence for the upper deck. So after that, I went back to detail the lower deck. The client asked for the main industry at this point to be a brewery. And since breweries can be pretty large industries, I allowed it to stretch for about 10 feet long backdrop with five spurs, three of which go through the backdrop for additional capacity where we have no space. And then there's five smaller industries over this side of town. Although it's fairly low off the ground, we came to the conclusion that it could still be a viable operating area operated from a low chair because since it's wrapped around a horseshoe curve, a swivel chair in this location allows the operator to pretty much reach the entire town while also staying for the most part out of the way of the upper deck operators. I also extended the yard lead halfway around the end curve of the staging yard, which allows a local freight to be staged without tying up one of the long through tracks. The hidden length is around 10 feet, which should be long enough for a decent local. And even if it isn't, it probably won't be too obtrusive to have the first two or three feet of it sticking through the backdrop into the visible portion, provided the whole lead track can be isolated so the train doesn't draw attention to itself with its sound system blaring away. Another thing that could happen while operating this area is a through freight could pause to exchange a block of cars with the local freight. Since there is always a fair bit of green belt within city areas, I've added some here. It's a good opportunity for a couple of small bridges to contrast with the big ones at the other end of the room. And I've put in a road underpass to contrast with the roads that go over the track everywhere else. We don't want the bench work deeper than necessary at this point. So once again, we want the rivers and the road to be as close to track level as we can. I suggested making this a particularly low bridge so we can have an interesting vignette here with a box truck stuck underneath it. I guess my inspiration for that came from the 11 foot 8 bridge, which is fairly famous on YouTube. Check it out if you're interested. It has claimed hundreds of box trucks in its lifetime. The rest of this area I have just fleshed out. Not much has changed except at this end of the room where instead of having just a simple two track stub end staging yard, there is room for a full active fiddle yard if he wants it. He may not do so. He might just put a couple of stub end tracks in here. Although I've shown it this way, so he has options. Then one other improvement I made, the opening in the wall on this middle deck for the ethanol plant meant that there was room to extend the backdrop back a little bit further. It's not needed for any track features, but it does give a few extra inches of scenery depth behind the back track. And behind that, underneath the ethanol plant, there is plenty of room for his control cabinet. Remember in the initial plan that he sent me, it was where this helix now is. But he said, no problems, we'll just find somewhere else for it. And we both independently chose this location. I suggested it and he said, yep, yeah, that's where he was already thinking. Now note how there is an access hatch drawn on the back side of this front cliff in front of the river. Because of the depth of this scene, I came up with the idea of building this as a full walk on deck with two by sixes and three quarter inch plywood. So the river surface becomes a deck that can be walked on to detail all the scenery that can't easily be reached from the front. The access hatch can be hinged along its upper edge so it can swing down out of the way. And then once all the scenery is fully detailed, you can climb in that way and finish the river. These two big bridges in front will have to be removable until that stage. Anyway, with this area fully detailed, it's no longer possible to also show the hidden track underneath it. So for any of my viewers who may be fans of the movie Kung Fu Panda, there is now a level zero. So this diagram allows the detail of the hidden track to be shown you may notice I've got rid of the double cross over here and replaced it with two singles because there was room for it. And there is now enough clearance between the two levels that these turnouts are easily accessible. Originally, I thought the clearance was going to be very restricted here, so I wanted to minimize the turnouts in this point. I also showed him on this plan how we could have a temporary cutoff where the sawmill goes 
allowing him to finish the bottom deck of the layout and put a temporary continuous run in coming back down the bottom two laps of the main helix allowing him to get a fully operational railroad while he builds the second deck and this was something that had been on his mind for much of the design process and he just hadn't asked me about it and he was very happy that he was going to be able to build it in more manageable stages it's also possible to do the same on the second deck although i didn't draw it that way here is the second deck in all its glory the city over the town i suggested just two streets at an angle to each other city hall behind it this structure is shown the size of the walters union station which would be a good starting point for a city hall now it can be lengthened to almost twice as long if it wants to by using sections of the surplus back wall the passenger terminal building can be quite elaborate over one side and then over the other we'll probably have shopping centers and hotels or whatever although i haven't drawn it parking along the city streets may be advisable at this point and we have a park in the middle i dubbed it triangle park because it's a triangle i've shown how the spurs at this industry can pass under the two track staging yard for the branch line we don't need a lot of clearance at this point because we don't have to get double stacks and other high sided cars it can be limited to steam era height box cars because the limiting factor will be the doors on the industry building we have an awkward situation here i did explain how i would take care of it to the client although it's beyond the scope of this video as are full specifications of the structural implications of this layout one other modification I made in this corner was to make sure that the industries in the middle of the south wall would hide the grain delivery tracks so that they can be assumed to continue further than they actually do. Remember, the client said he wanted a large grain facility. So I've done as large as I can in the space I've been able to set aside for it. I think I've already described everything else on this level. Here we see the full length staging tracks for grain trains behind the ethanol plant. And the only thing that's changed on third level is that I've added the place names. Here's the Northern subdivision that I didn't have last time I drew this and the elevations. In most cases, they've dropped by an inch, although there are exceptions. So before signing off, I will just go back through all the levels again, giving you clean versions that are not defaced with all the labels. Here we have level zero showing the details of the low level hidden tracks. Level one, level two, level three, and sky staging. So I'm just gonna sign off here. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation and I hope to see you again next week. Thanks for watching and bye for now.